in, in an age. All right, in an age of populism, question mark is the topic here. Um, and uh, before I start, I wanted to thank my collaborators at the University of Zurich and beyond, which is always important and a good thing to do because many of the things that I will present I haven't done on my own, which is maybe particularly important here because the concept of science related populism I've developed with uh, Niels Mede, uh, who you see in the, in the middle, in the upper row there. And he's the actual expert, I have to say, on science related populism, but I will, you'll have to make do with me today. The plan for the talk is this it's, it's four parts. And the first part, I'll tell you a little bit about about how, how, we, how I see science communication and the related research field. Then that's still the big picture part of things. I will uh, talk about the science communication media ecosystem, core results, current challenges of research that we have there. And then I will zero in on uh, science related populism, first conceptualizing it or presenting you how we tried to conceptualize it. And in the second or the fourth part, then try to apply this, bring this together with uh, science communication. So first part, science communication and the related research field. Science communication, that's uh, uh, maybe not necessary to elaborate much in this round here, has become an important issue, of course. Uh, and there's a lot of societal players that have acknowledged that from scientific academies like the All Ear, which is the, the umbrella organization of the European Academies of Sciences. The report on the right, which you also see uh, there on the wall behind me, is a report we did for the Swiss Academies of the Sciences assessing the state of science communication in Switzerland. And there's in Germany, there's the Factory Viscom, which tried to, to assess science communication. There are things like scientific uh, associations and outlets like AAAS that have highlighted the importance of science communication, or the Sackler Colloquia, which many of you will know on the issue. There are things like the March for Science uh, that have happened. And of course, there are uh, journalistic, there's a journalistic discussion going on on science communication in news media, in blogs, etc. Um, and relatedly to that, a research field has developed around science communication, a research field that has grown considerably in recent years. If you if you only look like like uh, um, Günther and Hubert have done here, if you only look at the number of publications on the field in the main journals, for example, you see a clear rise of the number of publications as an indicator of growth of the field. You see a diversification of the field. That's something that we have done a couple of years back, where we tried to grab as many studies on science communication that we can or could found from, from uh, publication databases and did uh, bibliometric analysis, co-citation analysis to figure out, well, what are the, the prevalent communities in the field? And you see a whole range of different communities on SDS, on sociology of science, on open science, on bibliometrics, and also on mediated science communication on my field, if you like. And you can see in the lower graph there that all of them have been rising in volume. So there's more and more research being done on this field. Um, and the field is institutionalizing also. So there's an, an increasing number of chairs at universities dealing with science communication or with analyses of science communication. There's professional uh, associations like the PCST. There are journals on the field like science communication or public understanding of science. And there's a whole number of introduc uh, introductory textbooks and encyclopedias that try to bring together and synthesize the knowledge that we have accumulated in the field. And uh, that's also worth mentioning because a lot of the findings that will come later uh, have to be interpreted in this, in this light in a way. There is still a number of gaps and biases in the field. The first one is, that's again the Günther Joubert study that you see here. The first one is that most of the studies that we have, at least in international journals and the journals I just mentioned, most of these studies are actually done in Western or quote unquote weird countries, so weird meaning Western educated, industrialized, rich democratic countries. And particularly, as you can see in the, in, the, in the darker colors in this world map there, particularly in Anglophone countries, which are peculiar, of course, uh, when it comes to debates about science or about some science related issues, certainly. We also see that a lot of the field actually focuses on STEM subjects, so on the natural sciences quite strongly, whereas considerably fewer uh, uh, analyses are being done on the social sciences and arts. And there's a strong focus on selected media. There's a strong focus on print media, for example, and on selected platforms also. So Twitter, certainly until Elon Musk took over, 
was the platform to go in a way to do studies on science communication because the data was easily accessible and available. And in this field, the understanding of science communication that we find is a rather broad one. So an, like a generic definition of science communication uh, is that it encompasses all communication in, from, and about science, including a diverse set of communicators, diverse set of content also, including the use the effects of this content. Or if you want to, to uh, uh, portray this schematically, then Stoddard's Morgner have proposed this one here, where they distinguish two, like the two major bubbles here. One is internal communication, that's communication in science or within science. So with scientific audiences by scientists, so scholarly communication, if you like, where they distinguish formal and informal uh, uh, ways of doing so. And then, and that's actually the, the focus that I will focus on and also that I do most of my work on, this one here, which is external science communication. They call it so science communication with non-academic audiences. And again, they differentiate between self-communicated external science communication, that's communication from science to the public, which can be, they say, primarily interest-driven and not primarily interest-driven. Not primarily interest-driven, they say, would be like scientists' blog, children's universities, uh, science labs, etc. Primarily interest-driven would be university PR, marketing, corporate publishing done by scientific organizations, etc. And on the other side, you have external science communication that is being done by third parties. So science communication about science which again, they say, can be primarily interest-driven or not primarily interest-driven. Not primarily interest-driven would be, for example, journalism or science journalism. Primarily interest-driven would be PR from politics, from economics, from NGOs, maybe also the communication by social media influencers uh, as far as it, as it concerns science. So what that means in terms of object for the research that I'm doing usually when I focus on mediated science communication is well, this encompasses the communication by scientific organizations on uh, uh, towards uh, media, for example, but also using social media like the University of Zurich is doing there. It encompasses the communication by individual scientists on blogs or like uh, 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 Dostens uh, in Germany, certainly a famous podcast on, on the uh, COVID-19 pandemic or my, my brand new Mastodon account that you can see up there. It, of course, includes science journalism in its various forms and facets. It includes fictional communication that touches upon science, like CSI, forensics, or like Big Bang Theory. And it also includes communication that uh, is on science or behaves like uh, it, it tackles science and communicates about science, but that is actually coming from uh, uh, a, a critical side, let's say, like vaccination skeptics or, or creationist campaigns. So that's uh, like the, the very major uh, um, umbrella for the talk. If we focus in more closely on the science communication ecosystem as far as the mediated uh, ecosystem is concerned, I wanted to present you a couple of core results and current uh, changes that I see. And I will do that using this admittedly rather crude typology here. Science communication in reality, of course, is not that neatly delineated into communicators, intermediaries, content and audiences, like communicators in the digital media age, or audiences, let's say, in the digital media age, of course, have also the opportunity quickly on social media to actually become communicators or to become, as Axel Bruns has called it, producers that are not limited to just using science communication or using content that is uh, related to science, but also producing it, sharing it, commenting upon it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I wanted to show you a couple of, uh, I wanted to introduce these perspectives to you because I will get back to them when I talk about science-related populism in the second part of the talk. And I wanted to uh, uh, share some of the core findings that I see there with you. So let's first look at uh, the communicators where the core question, if you like, is, well, who communicates on science or science-related issues? To whom? With what aims? With what strategies? On what channels? And the focus of the research field is mostly on scientists and scientific organizations here, but it's not limited to that. It also tackles corporate and political communication on science and science-related issues, of course. It tackles what Peter Mesela has called alternative science communicators, like NGOs, like think tanks, 
including also Chaplin uh, have called it far right communicators and includes different forms of communication, including public engagement, including media relations, including PR, including marketing as well. And some, and that's not a finite list here, but some of the findings that you will find there are, what we see is a general pluralization of communicators on science and science related issues in recent years. So more and more diverse communicators have emerged that comment on science and science related issues on public. We see if we look at individual scientists, uh, scientists, an increasing openness of individual scientists towards public communication and public engagement. We also see that they do that increasingly, communicate uh, to the public, but not in a way that would be proportionate to the increase in openness. Uh, so some of them, even though they think it's important and they would be willing and open towards doing that, actually don't do it. And that has to do with a number of social and systemic factors with peer support with uh, with incentive structures in the organized in scientific organizations in the system of science uh, etc cetera, etc cetera, which influence and which can hinder of course researchers willingness uh, to actually engage and we also have research showing that for many of them for many of these individual scholars deficit model motivation for science communication so essentially the motivation to disseminate and explain quote unquote, the science is still very prevalent among them. But what has risen in recent years is more of a, our, our motivations that are geared towards actual dialogical public engagement. And also what we see is an increasing strategic motivation among individual scientists. They communicate to the outside because they think they will benefit from that personally or professionally. What we also see is an extensification, a strong extensification actually of organizational science communication. There's a nice study by Julia Zerong and others a couple of years back who analyzed uh, essentially the number of, of press releases and other forms of public communication being put out by different organizations in science. And what you can see here without looking at the details is across a whole range of different types of organizations in the science in, 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 in the academic world, many of them actually have communicated more and more over the years. And what we also see is a professionalization of organizational science communication and an increasing focus on strategic goals, on, on goals that are aligned with the strategic goals of the respective organizations. If we look at the second part here, the intermediaries. So the, the instances, the, the stakeholders, the organizations that mediate between science and the publics. The core questions here are, well, who is that? Who are these mediators based on which criteria or which working routines do they select, do they present, do they curate science-related content? And the focus naturally has been strongly on science journalism or science journalists here, but also, and increasingly also on professional science communicators like the staff of, of organizational press offices. There's some research on new intermediaries like science media centers that have sprung up in, in, in quite a few countries a few years ago. And there's increasing research on social media influencers and also on the role of tech platforms who algorithmically, of course, curate science communication. And what this research shows is, again, first of all, a, what's called a disintermediation of science communication or parts of science communication, meaning that the role of communication intermediaries between science and society has been reduced. Many scientists, many scientific organizations now communicate more or less or try to communicate more or less directly with the public. We see a, an economic, a strong economic and structural crisis of journalism that also strongly affects science journalism, uh, which these are pictures. The left one is from Germany, the right one is from Switzerland, but you can, you can uh, uh, show them for any number of countries, essentially, where you see that audiences are shrinking in traditional media, you see that revenue from ads is shrinking in traditional media. Um, so that the business, the traditional business model of journalism is eroding, is in danger. Uh, and that affects science journalism also strongly, which was not a traditional desk available or, or, or existing in all media outlets to begin with, and which, is, which has come under pressure as well. And what we see is a number of new and new organizational models like these there that try to uh, develop new business models, if you like, of, of uh, science journalism. 
balancing editorial independence on the one hand and economic sustainability on the other hand. And these are the, the models that you see here is, uh, the first one is the SNC, it's the Science Media Centers um, that emerged in the UK and that try to uh, uh, collect raw material that they pro provide free of charge to science raw material for, for science coverage, that they provide free of charge to science journalists that subscribe to their services allowing them ideally to then write their own articles or do their own news segments uh, about science. You have models like the conversation in Australia funded by all Australian universities that support uh, uh, science journalism, or you have models like the Swiss model, the SDA model that you can see there, where uh, scientific institutions in Switzerland, like the academies and some universities, fund positions for science journalists at the national news agency hoping that what they produce there then trickles down, but because all the, the, the Swiss media or most of the Swiss media have subscribed to the service of SDA, that then trickles down into the coverage of all kinds of other media outlets. What we also see is a rise of activist journalism uh, on certain issues, at least like climate change. We see an emergence of novel intermediaries like influencers, I mentioned that already, but also like celebrities and like what's been called alternative media. So the uh, internationally, at least famous example is Breitbart there, Russia Today is an, an, another example, or in, in Austria would be uh, uncensuriert.at, so alternative media. We have a rise of alternative platforms as intermediaries in communication, including science communication, like Gap, like Parler, like Acun, like Donald Trump's new project, Truth Social. And we have instant messengers that have gained in importance, of course. And relatedly, uh, we see a rising role of tech platforms uh, as intermediaries who curate considerable segments of science communication now and uh, who do that, of course, to large part uh, algorithmically. Third part, content. The core question here is, well, how are science and science related issues presented to or communicated by the public? How does this differ also across different types of media, across different topics, across different contexts, across different uh, countries also? And the analysis here have strongly focused on news media and especially on, on print media and their coverage of science. And as I said earlier, also strongly on STEM subjects, on Western countries, etc. There is increasingly more research being done on social media, mainly on Twitter, but recently that has started to diversify as well. So we have studies now on, on Instagram, on YouTube, on TikTok recently. And what they show, for example, is a strong rise in news media coverage about science until the mid 2000s approximately. That's a meta study by Martin Bauer that you can see here, who has tried to map uh, the, the amount simply of science related news coverage over 150 years actually over there. Uh, and since the mid 2000s, it's been mostly stable with the exception of the enormous peak during the COVID-19 pandemic that we just witnessed. Um, we see that in science section, uh, science sections, uh, the topics that are being discussed are mostly STEM topics. So this Sum and Volker study that you can see there, what they consider the narrow definition uh, uh, in the caption there, so the, the darker parts, that's the science sections essentially, and you see that the natural science, life sciences, engineering, etc., they are more prominent there. Whereas if you look at the what they call the broader definition, which is essentially the entire coverage of news media, there you see that the social sciences are actually quite prominent, particularly political science, uh, for example. We see that media coverage usually focuses on very few individual scholars, something that was even uh, uh, exacerbated. Uh, uh, even further catalyzed, if you like, during the COVID-19 pandemic. But apart from that, we've actually seen a pluralization of voices and perspectives also beyond science. Uh, so the diversity of stakeholders that we have communicating of science have also made their way, found their, their uh, presence in news media, which for some issues certainly has led to an increase in controversy about uh, certain science-related issues in recent years. And of course, we've seen a growth there, the Pew study that tried to assess how much science-related content is there in, in, uh, on Facebook and on other uh, social media. We've seen a growth of science-related online and social media content. 
and I div a diversification there as well, with, of course, a considerable amount of this and this information. And last part, if we look at the audiences, the core question there is, of course, well, which people consume which also science related content, where or what, what media do they use, and how does it affect their knowledge, their attitudes, maybe their behaviors? Um, early on, the focus of this, this part of the research field was strongly on scientific literacy, on learning, if you like. So do people learn about science if they use media uh, or, or mediated content about science? Recently, this has also diversified. Uh, so uh, scholars have differentiated between different audiences and their specific uses of news and social media. Um, Oh, sorry, and uh, they have focused also on attitudinal aspects other than cognitive aspects, other than learning, like interests, like trusts, uh, and in some fields also on uh, behavioral effects of science communication, like in climate change communication. And what we see is uh, that, for example, population segments differ quite strongly in their attitudes towards science and also in the media diets that they use when they inform themselves about science related issues. This, uh, what you see here, is a result from a study that we are doing regularly here in, in Switzerland, which is the Science Barometer of Switzerland, where we regularly survey the Swiss population and what they think about science and science-related issues. And we use the data that we had there to uh, identify uh, different segments of the Swiss population that looks at science-related issues differently. And uh, I can go into more detail if you're interested in that later, but just quickly what you see, for example, is the upper left uh, quadrant there. In Switzerland, about a quarter of the population uh, uh, ended up in what we call the science file. So people with a strong interest and a pronounced amount of trust in science that actively inform themselves about science-related issues that use a diverse set of different media, including a lot of online sources to do so. Uh, and that are also probably the groups that are, or uh, the group that is easiest uh, to get uh, uh, to attend many of the of the traditional science communication formats, so if you invite people to universities, to science related talks, to science slams, etc., these are the people that are most likely probably to actually go there. And below that, you see what we call the passive supporters, which is the largest group in Switzerland. Forty percent of the people who are not uh, uh, skeptical about science or anything, they trust science. They trust science, though, if you like, from a distance in a way. So they have the impression that science is certainly trustworthy and should be publicly funded and uh, maybe also does good things, but also maybe doesn't have that much to do with their everyday lives. So they are not a group that would inform itself uh, avidly and actively about science and science related issues. They get information content related to science more as bycatch in their routine media use. And they're an interesting group, I find, not only because they're a big group, but also because they're a group that is not as easily reached with the usual science communication formats. And other findings that we have when it comes to audiences are, for example, that news media and their online representation are still an important source for many people when they get content about science, also in social media, where news media content is still uh, widely shared and uh, uh, liked or not liked or commented upon, etc. Um, we see that social media, especially video-based social media like YouTube, like TikTok, are very important for the young. We see a rise in importance, certainly during the pandemic also, of instant messengers. Uh, and when it comes to effects, we see a lot of, well, we, we've uh, seen that agenda setting effects or setting certain issues on the public agenda are quite well established, both in terms of the public agenda and of the agenda of decision makers. But we've also seen, for example, that effects of disseminating knowledge, quote unquote, explaining the science uh, on attitudes or of the, on behavior uh, uh, of people are actually rather limited for many people. At least. So, with that, uh, uh, two of the fours through the uh, through these uh, four uh, uh, subfields of of research on science communication, I would end like the big picture talk of my presentation here, and I would rather uh, now zero in on well, the age of populism, as I have uh, that's not my invention, the term, uh, but as I have called it here. So. 
what what is that? What is this age of populism? How does it affect maybe science communication? This zeroes in now on uh, science related or what we call science related populism. And um, I will get back to the taxonomy that you have just seen then later on. So um, the, the point of departure here for us also when we try to, to deal with this issue or try to conceptualize uh, science related populism was that, uh, as you all know, around the world, populist movements have emerged in the past years, in some countries, even decades. Populist politicians and parties have that, that usually claim to promote the, the, the will of, of the people and challenge established elites and, and structures have positioned themselves quite prominently on issues like immigration, but also on science-related issues like climate change, for example. They have gained considerable voter support. And this has led some scholars to diagnose an age of populism. And the thing that interested us is that populists do not only target political elites. They also target political elites, of course. They also target, though, other societal uh, institutions that they see as representing the societal establishment like the mainstream media, the Lügenpresse uh, uh, debate that we had in many German-speaking countries, for example, uh, uh, plays a role here. They address economic elites, uh, transnational corporations, et cetera, et cetera, or things like the, the World Economic Forum in Davos. And they, they, they address science and representatives of science. And these are maybe arguably two of the best known uh, uh, examples here. The, the, on, uh, uh, on top there, you see Michael Gove, former UK Justice Minister, who famously claimed that the British people have enough of experts from organisations with acronyms telling them what they know, uh, 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 what they know uh, uh, is best. Or Donald Trump, uh, who said, for example, that he had a natural instinct, like a gut feeling, that supersedes scientific evidence. And there's other examples like that that you find in protests or in petitions, uh, etc., uh, uh, tackling science, many of them prominent also during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we wanted to look closer at that. We wanted to look closer at that under the label of science-related populism as a specific form of populist and or of anti-scientific uh, sentiment. Um, and mind you, there are many variants of critical stances towards science, and many of them are not science-related populism, like uh, concerns about the ethical, legal, social implications of biotechnology or counter-research being done by corporations trying to contradict scientific findings about things like smoking or secondhand smoking or religiously motivated objections and other forms. There's many forms that are not science-related populism, so we don't intend this to be like an umbrella term for all kinds of, of science-related critiques. But we felt that there are variants of criticism or a variant of criticism that can be conceptualized as science-related populism. And we agree with Ila Antile uh, has written a couple of years back that it's more relevant than ever to study the linkage between populism and the production of communication of knowledge, including scientific knowledge. And that is something we wanted to do here. So we wanted to know, well, what, what could science-related populism be? How might it differ from other forms of populism? What would be its key uh, elements? How could we measure that? How can we maybe then also uh, uh, assess this empirically, its prevalence, its drivers, and its impact? And the whole idea for us rests on three pillars, three conceptual pillars, if you like. The first one is um, we wanted, uh, uh, or we argue, well, Science-related populism is conceptually akin, similar to at least some aspects of political populism. Political populism usually has this structure here. There's uh, a perceived antagonism, in this case about political decision-making or political decision-making sovereignty, that populists say the people should legitimately have, but the elites illegitimately enact and claim for them. So that's, this, this basic antagonism here is the first pillar, the starting point for us to conceptualize science-related populism. And what we added to that are two more pillars. One is the scholarship on what's been called the participatory turn, which has diagnosed an increasing demand for citizen participation that extends to other fields of society as well, beyond politics. 
Um, and that has to do, Ludon uh, wrote, with a distrust in established elites and a growing confidence in the capabilities of an increasingly educated citizenry. Um, and this research, if you look at it, shows that, well, first of all, these demands for citizen participation often extend to fields other than politics, to social movements, to economic uh, uh, context, to art, and also to science, for example. And they also show that in these other fields, they often tackle what Gerhardt has called the core logics of these other realms of society. So uh, whereas in politics, it's about political decision-making sovereignty, in other fields, it will be about different things. And the core logic of science, our argument was then, is the production of new knowledge and of the, the, the production also of methodological procedures to approximate truth. And that's the third pillar. So the, the, the um, proposal of an alternative epistemology that should, in the view of science related populism, supplant uh, the scientific epistemology. And the basic structure that we have or proposed here is in a way similar, as I said, to political populism. So you again have, you have four components here, not, not only three. You have the people, you have the academic elite, and you have two issues that uh, uh, the antagonism between the elite, the academic elite and the people is about here, which is science-related decision-making sovereignty and truth-speaking sovereignty. Let's look at that in more detail. First, the people who are portrayed here in the view of science-related populism as a collective of citizens who are, first of all, epistemologically different from science. They are epistemologically normal or ordinary because their preferred form of knowledge is everyday experience, uh, straightforward common sense, if you like, and practical application of, of that and practical experiences underlying that, who are also often seen as homogenous because they share this common sense and have a shared set, allegedly, of experiences, values, and interests that are their common denominator, and who are seen as uh, uncorrupted, if you like, virtuous, if you like, uh, because they are not biased by elite interest in the view of science-related populism. In turn, the academic elite is portrayed as the antagonists of the people, as a collective of scientists, experts, academic uh, institutions, and other actor, uh, uh, actors who uh, allegedly uh, hold uh, superior authority in, in, in epistemological uh, uh, matters, who produce uh, knowledge that is not all that useful and that is inauthentic, partly, that conspire with other elites, and that follow elitist ideological agendas like multi multiculturalism or political correctness. And between these two, the academic elite and the people, there's two points of contention. The first one is science-related decision-making sovereignty. So that's, that's the first concept, uh, conflict here, which means the right to make decisions on research agendas, on funding allocation, on the publication and withholding of results also, and the claim here is that the academic elite has the power to actually do that, has the right to determine, for example, research agendas and to do research on things like climate change or gender studies, etc. whereas the people should actually have that right. And in turn, you have a second point of contention, a second conflict, and that's about or around truth speaking sovereignty. So the right to determine what is actually considered as true knowledge in society around certain issues like vaccination, like evolution and other topics, for example. And again, the claim is that, well, it's the academic elite that have that or that illegitimately claim that truth speaking uh, authority, whereas it should actually be the people doing so. So that's essentially the, the, the argumentative logic that we have proposed as characteristic of science-related populism, again, as a one specific kind of critique directed towards science, not as an umbrella term, and as a kind of critique directed towards science that has parallels, but if not identical with political populism. And that leads me to my last part here, which is, uh, um, yeah, if you like, it's, it's partly a research report because we have done a little bit of research on that already and partly it's also a research agenda so there's a couple of things in here that we will maybe we would, we would like certainly 
to do more research on in the next years. And we can go back to this taxonomy that I've shown you uh, earlier on. Um, and I will first look at the audience uh, side here, which again is the, the, the bit of a crude taxonomy. So, so bear with me and forgive me for, for that. Um, and I'm starting with that because on the audience side, on the one hand, there is some research already out there that has um, not focused on science related populism, but on public attitudes towards science in general, but that shows aspects of what we have described as or what we would interpret as science related populist attitudes uh, of the public. So, for example, if you look at favorable, uh, favorable conceptions of ordinary people, you find things like uh, Oliver Wood in 2018, who showed that almost half of, of uh, US uh, of the Americans, of, of people in the US, agree that ordinary people are perfectly capable of deciding for themselves what's true and what's not. Uh, you have indicators of unfavorable conceptions of the academic elite. Things like 42% of Belgians saying, well, people who have studied for a long time and have many diplomas do not really know well what makes the world go round. You have demands for decision making sovereignty of the people, like Science Barometer Switzerland, where we can show that every every fifth Swiss wants to have a say in decisions about the topics that scientists research. And you have demands for truth speaking sovereignty. A third of the Germans, for example, say that we should rely more on common sense, on the common sense of people and less on scientific studies. But all of that, again, doesn't focus on science related populism. So that's something we have actually done some research on, which is the second reason I wanted to focus on audiences first here. And what we have done here is mostly related to the Science Barometer Switzerland that I mentioned already, the survey project that we are doing regularly in Switzerland. So we try to figure out, well, how can we measure this science related populism in uh, population surveys in Switzerland and beyond? And that was also the first paper that we did. We tried to develop a survey scale to measure that, the SIPOP uh, uh, scale where we, uh, the question essentially was, well, how do we measure science related populist attitudes in population surveys? And we used a first systematic review of survey instruments from political populism research and from research on science related attitudes in general, selected a big set of questions from that, did two pretests, did two representative surveys with various kinds of analysis, or analyses in German, French, and Italian in Switzerland and developed in the end an eight item scale to measure science related populist attitudes in survey uh, research, which is uh, this one here. And you can see in the, in the left column there that represents the four dimensions of science related populism that I introduced earlier. And this is a scale that we have used in several of the studies that I will present uh, in a second. It's also been used in surveys now in Austria, actually, in Germany, in Taiwan, and in the US. And it's also part of a 60 plus country many lab study that is currently going on. And it's been also used to assess, and maybe uh, Jakob Moritz Ewell can, can say a couple of sentences about that, to actually do a study to figure out, well, empirically, does science related populism differ from political populism or from political populist attitudes, actually, that people might harbor? So, and based, uh, Quickly coming back, based on this study now, we've done a couple of analyses trying to figure out, well, how prevalent, et cetera, is science-related populism in Switzerland. That was the first one of these studies. And the question here was, well, how prevalent are these attitudes among the Swiss and with, who are the people uh, having or holding these attitudes? Um, based on the Science Barometer Switzerland. And what we found there was that, first of all, science-related populist attitudes are not very widespread at least not the entire set. So it's what we wrote, there was only a small minority of the Swiss support the full spectrum of science related populism. Even though sizable portions endorse components of size, uh, science related populism, which suggests that a considerable number of people may be prone to developing support. What we also saw, we tried to compare this with, with findings from, from colleagues here in Switzerland, it seems less widespread certainly than political populism. What we also found is that science related populism does not have a clear socio demographic locus, if you like, in terms of age, so the young or the old, or gender, male, female, or region in Switzerland. But what it does, uh, uh, what does appear to be the case is, is, is it uh, appears to be more common among people with lower education, 
with moderate and right-leaning views, people with little contract, uh, contact with science and low scientific literacy, and people with high interest in science. We did uh, another empirical study trying to figure out, using a panel design here actually, to figure out what well, during the pandemic or actually during the early phase at least of the of the COVID-19 pandemic, how have these attitudes, science-related populist attitudes developed over time among the same people? So we surveyed, uh, it was 150 people approximately, the same people before and during the pandemic. And what we found there was that at least initially in the early phase of the pandemic, science-related populism uh, declined actually so we what we saw there was what social psychologists have called a rally around the flag dynamic here uh, similar to findings in other countries that have shown a rise in during the pandemic a rise in support for political authorities a rise in trust in science a decrease of political populism and or an, an increase in technocratic orientations and what we saw is that this decline was stronger among avid uh, supporters of science-related populism as well and uh, last study, and that's the one we are currently working on, and that is under review uh, uh, at the moment, was the connection to science communication. So where do people with science-related populist attitudes actually inform themselves about science? And how do they communicate about it uh, uh, themselves? So how, where do they get information about science from? And how do they themselves then uh, uh, communicate about science-related issues? Again, based on the Science Barometer Switzerland, um, and distinguishing these two dimensions that I just mentioned, information use on the one side and communication, uh, communicative engagement on the other side. And what we found here was, first of all, there's, there doesn't seem to be a general disconnectedness. That's Blackerson and others. That's a term, public, a term from public sphere theory, uh, expressing the fear that people with populist attitudes may be entirely detached from uh, societal debates and public communication in general. That's not what we find in uh, among people with science-related populist attitudes. They would still use news media, for example, to inform themselves about science-related issues in general. But we do find differences in their information and media uh, diet. So we find that they inform themselves about science-related issues more often than others, for example, in commercial television and on social media. And we find the out the, the outreach component, if you like, we find differences in communicative engagement. So people with science-related populist attitudes communicate more actively about science on social networking sites and also in their social circles, so among friends, family, and colleagues. So last part, back to this taxonomy uh, that you've seen already. On the other three uh, boxes that you can see here, apart from the audience box, the communicators, intermediaries, and content, we haven't really done research yet, uh, apart from the bit that I just showed you where we looked at, well, to what extent do members of the public become communicators uh, on science-related issues a little bit. But it's, we haven't done many and, and comprehensive analyses on, the, on these, on these uh, three boxes on the right here, if you like. But there's a number of things that are interesting. And I, uh, before I wrap up, wanted to give you an idea at least of what the topics could be that would be of interest here. So the communicators, which communicators propagate science-related populism? That would be what, what others have called the supply side of populism. And what we have here is a number of uh, examples, anecdotal examples uh, of journalists, of celebrities, of businessmen using rhetoric that we would interpret as being science-related populism when discussing uh, science-related issues in public. There is a whole range of analyses that analyze the rhetoric and the programs of populist parties with regards to science in Belgium and France and Germany and Sweden and other countries, but without connecting it to our concept of science-related populism. There are analyses of social media users and citizens, conspiracy, uh, on, and citizens and conspiracy communities and how they use populist rhetoric. So there's Harambam and Hopper, for example, who have described that conspirational communities or conspiracy communities often quote question why the experiential knowledge people gather in their life remains unacknowledged by experts and this is something that fits in our concept for example quite well and we have we see at least a few studies first studies that have taken up our concept in brazil in france and in the us and try to interpret what they saw 
on uh, during the pandemic that was uh, in terms of, well, is this science or is it populism? If we look at intermediaries, interesting, the, the, like the overarching question would be, well, which intermediaries afford and amplify science-related populism? Um, so what are the reactions of journalists and legacy media towards populist uh, uh, communication? Um, and how do they cover that, actually? Um, of particular interest here would be, of course, alternative media that have been analyzed with regards to political populism, but also alternative or quote unquote dark platforms like Gap, like Parler, like Aidkun, like Truth Social, and of course, the role of instant messengers, which again have been analyzed, but not regarding to science related populism, but for example, regarding conspiracy theories with, with connection to science. And last part. In terms of content, well, how is science related populism represented in public debates in news and in social media? So analyzing news media coverage of science related populism that has been done on political populism quite extensively also would be interested also uh, interesting also for science related populism. Um, also, or including maybe the news media's role in what has been called normalizing or mainstreaming uh, streaming populist rhetoric. There's a number of studies uh, on that out there. And also analyzing the representation of in social media and in messengers, including the use of political memes, etc., would certainly be very interesting and something we would be interested in. So uh, coming back to that, um, the, the, the basic takeaways, or some at least of the basic takeaways that I have here is if we look at the specific case, science-related populism, um, that we propose to conceptualize science-related populism as a specific kind of criticism towards science that exists in attitudes of, of people, of course, but also in other aspects, as I tried to show you, of science communication. And we think that's worth worthwhile because forms of science-related critique are often generic and or conceptually underdefined. So it's actually important, we think, to try to conceptually define clearly the, 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 the logic and the argu argumentative uh, 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 structure of forms of science related criticism, which is good to know in order to recognize them, to measure them, also to normatively evaluate them, and maybe also to potentially uh, deal with them in a way or to counteract them. And if we look at the other side on the general topics so on science, uh, on science communication and the changes that we see, like big picture in mediated science communication, there are considerable changes in the media ecosystem that, as I tried to show you, affect science communication more generally. And some examples are the increasing role of communicators, both from science, but also from other walks of life that communicate on science and science related issues. A shifting balance of power that we see between certain communicators, including universities, for example, and traditional intermediaries like journalists, where the balance of power is shifting towards uh, uh, organizational communication, or organizational PR, for example. We see a changing role and a changing importance also of intermediaries and of certain contextual cues that you get about the trustworthiness, for example, of certain science-related content. And we see more generally more complex media repertoires and media diets, if you like, that users have and that need to be accounted for when analyzing science related, uh, not science related, science communicated. So that's it from me. And with that, I stop and look forward to your comments and discussions and questions and criticisms. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very lovely, interesting talk. Uh, much appreciated. <clears throat> Before we actually open uh, the floor for questions, uh, we're very happy and lucky to have Jakob Moritz Eva uh, to put it into a context and into an Austrian context. And um, yeah, the floor is yours. Jakob. Thank you. Um, you should see my slides. Is that correct? We see oh, your yes. PowerPoint uh, yes. environment. Mm -hmm. And now, now it's this. full screen or it's the presenter mode? The presenter mode. Ah, before it worked, why doesn't it work right now? Okay, I'm trying again. Wait, I'm uns unsharing. If I can, I'm sorry for this inconvenience. 
on sharing first well, you're, going you're bringing this up um, uh, Moritz, uh, actually uh, started in 2013 at the University of Vienna as a PhD student and we worked on the same floor uh, in different offices um, in different roles in different departments <laughs> uh, but it was fun to interact and uh, uh, so yeah so I'm back, I think. Do you see the full screen version now? Yes. Okay. The, on, the only problem now is that I won't be able to see you because I have two screens. So I will look into one screen and you will be on the other screen. I hope you'll forgive me for that. Um, so so yeah, my, my goal is to contextualize this a bit. Also, Mike, thank you to already alluding to some of the contents um, that I'll be addressing that we're working currently on also with uh, Niels uh, Mede, um, so the, the expert in science-related populism, um, prob probably the absolute expert in the world right now, which is not easy uh, to be, um, an easy thing to be. Um, and um, yes, I also have like two discussion points that I will that we'll want to like bring up and maybe also afterwards discuss a bit more um, also with Mike, but of course also with the with with everyone else. So my my um, I, I'll try to keep it short. My sh short um, response presentation is the contextualization with Austrian data a bit. Um, I want to also talk a little bit about uh, the consequences of science-related populism because this is something um, that that we've here been work uh, working on. And then the two discussion points that I'll get into detail uh, later. So my response is specifically to the second part of Mike's uh, presentation, so focusing more on um, the science-related attitudes in, uh, in, the, in the people, in the citizens. Um, but before we go to the citizens, I'll say a little bit more about the supply side, as Mike just said. So how is it in, how is it in Austria? Um, so here we have a quote from um, the FPÖ lead uh, uh, candidate or F FPÖ um, uh, the Freedom Right Party's elite candidate saying that the um, vaccines are a genetic experiment. Then uh, we have um, the Viennese lead candidate um, of the Freedom Party um, saying something about um, how the um, Hausverstand, so the um, gut feeling of uh, the people should be uh, more relevant in pandemic um, decision making uh, than uh, scientific expertise, for example. Um, and this is also something that doesn't only come up as an idea in uh, during the uh, COVID pandemic, but also came up before, or or will will probably come up uh, come up in the future when we will talk about um, the climate crisis um, as well. But um, this idea of science-related populism, especially in communication, isn't restricted to the Freedom Party in Austria. Just a few weeks back, um, there was the Minister of the Interior who said, uh, science is one thing, but facts uh, are something else, which was one of the quotes that made a lot of um, um, public, uh, uh, real public impact or an impact in public discourse. Um, in Austria. So one, one of the first ideas just to, uh, for everyone who's not in Austria, ha doesn't have an Austrian expertise uh, with them, I would say that the supply side of science-related populism, similar to the supply side of political populism, is actually quite high in Austria. But let's go to the demand side. So these graphs, you've seen them uh, quite a few times now already. Um, they're from the special euro barometer. Um, there's, there's at least this one, I think there's, an, there's another graph in there as well that kind of captures the idea of science-related populism uh, quite uh, well. What you see here is um, a graph on, uh, we can no longer trust scientists to tell the truth about controversial scientific and technological issues because they depend more and more on money from industry. So the idea of um, um, scientists to actually be driven by something else but uh, seeking um, empirical evidence, the scientific evidence. Um, and here we see, um, again, Austria rather um, above the EU27 um, average, so rather um, feeling that this is something um, to agree with, this is a statement to agree with. Um, within the Austrian Corona Panel Project, we've actually taken um, Niels, uh, Mike's and I forgot who the third author was. 
can you jump in, uh, Mike, Tobias, for a second? Tobias. And Tobias. Tobias. Uh, Fuchslins, exactly. Um, uh, scale, and we tested this in Austria. We actually asked it twice. Um, just a quick reminder, the data from the Austrian Corner Panel Project is openly available on the Austrian Social Science Data Archive. This is also just to give you a short overview of what we can see um, in Austria. Um, when it comes to um, the, um, the the people's and understanding of the people um, having um, being honest and of good character, um, of having um, of common sense uh, being being important. We see a rather large part of the Austrian population, more than one third, agreeing with that statement. But maybe also, and this is something I want to come I want to come back to later. Maybe these are not really problematic. Uh, no, it's not really a problematic dimension. Um, uh, of uh, science-related populism. Um, when we get to the more problematic um, uh, dimension, maybe um, such as uh, scientists and cahoots with politics and business, um, or we should really rely uh, more on common sense and less on scientific studies, um, or the people should have influence over work of scientists. Um, we we'll still see between, um, let's say, 16, 17, and um, a little bit under 30% of Austrians um, agreeing with the statement. Such so as um, similar to what Mike uh, just said before, the level of science related populism is, however, in Austria still uh, lower than that of political populism, where the idea is, uh, for example, something like compromise is something bad for politics or uh, political parties um, is the worst thing. Um, for a democracy. Um, still, we see um, uh, not um, definitely not small amount of the Austrian population ag agreeing with quite a few of these statements. What does that mean, and or why is that? Why is that? Is, is that even necessarily a problem? Um, this is, this is maybe a little bit of a complicated uh, graph, but I'll, I'll guide you through it, or rather I'll give you a little bit more information um, on, on, on this graph, like how did it come to that? Actually, um, uh, myself and colleagues, colleagues of mine, we've been working on the idea of science-related populism without knowing that it's, it's going to be called science-related populism. Uh, for quite a while um, um, already, and we're then uh, extremely thankful um, for Niels and, and Mike um, to actually write their first theory paper about this concept. Um, we back then, we were still working with political populist, which we now call political populist attitudes, which back then, back then were mainly pop uh, populist attitudes because there wasn't really something else besides um, uh, political populism. And we saw back then that our the model that we had in mind is that populist attitudes don't only work on trust in political institution, but they also work on trust in science and research. Having this idea of, of saying these are two uh, important pillars of a democratic society and populism kind of counteracts our ideal um, um, uh, view on, of how democracy um, um, should work. What we see here just um, to, to um, uh, wrap this up, is that populist attitudes among others, as Mike already said before, have a um, strong impact on COVID, for example, COVID conspiracy belief, independent of left-right ideology. Um, and we see a very similar pattern also when it comes to climate skepticism. Um, so this is also to say that why, while um, a lot of the science-related populism research that is that has been done now was focused on the COVID pandemic, because this is when um, uh, uh, Mike and, and his colleagues kind of started to really work on, the, not started to work on this, but started to publish actually on this topic, um, we are very much expecting this to be a um, concept that will stick with us even after the pandemic should should there be an after um, the pandemic eventually. But as you've seen here, um, since we've worked before actually with political populism and kind of helped with our model to come to similar conclusions, um, one of the important con uh, questions that we were working on after this um, was, 
Well, but how is it actually true that political and science related populism are two different things and are they different empirically? Because Mike just explained like how theoretically um, it makes a lot of sense that they are different, but are they different empirically? And so we had a small study um, done actually with, with NEOS um, where we, um, in, in the context of the Austrian Corona panel, first of all, looked at uh, whether the two correlated. So we had two both scales in, in our survey and we see, well, they correlate actually quite high. I mean, this is also something you would generally expect, but they're not the same. So this is, I mean, statistically, you would also expect them not to be the same, but they're, they're not like, they, they correlate not, they don't correlate that high. But then we looked at, so, do, do we actually need to think about which of these concepts we want to work with when we study specific um, uh, concepts? And here, for example, we try to figure out like how do they, they how do they relate, for example, to trust in government? Um, the uh, the red um, coefficients here are um, when you look at the different um, concepts individually in the model. The turquoise ones are when you put them together in a model. And you see, for example, if you want to, trust, uh, to study trust in government, you definitely see that political populism is a much stronger predictor than science related populism if you have both in the model. And there's a good argument maybe that actually political populism is what you still will want to focus on if you study trust in government. It's the other way around um, when you uh, want to study trust in science. Um, here, uh, political populism, while still being relevant, uh, it's much less relevant uh, than science related populism. However, where it gets really interesting is when you start to study something where actually the political um, uh, level and the science uh, level, um, uh, these two ideas, um, collide. And this is, for example, the expert decision making. So the idea of a technocratic government. What you see here is actually that um, if you if you just uh, look for political populism in a model, um, you find that actually political populists would prefer technocratic experts to uh, politicians uh, in government, which also makes sense. They hate politicians so much that technocratic uh, leaders um, would be like their saviors. Um, however, um, for, for um, scientific populists, if, if it's alone in the model, um, you don't really see something going on. If you put, because, because and that, uh, maybe that's one of you, would, would be one of your questions, why is that so? Because of course there's a large overlap between science related populists and political populists. However, when you put both in the same model, again, looking at the turquoise, turquoise uh, coefficients, you see that those who are high uh, on science related populist, uh, populism, but low on political populism will rather want to stick with politicians those who are high on political populism, but maybe a little bit lower on science related populism would still prefer uh, the um, technocrats um, instead of the politicians. Um, when it comes to um, uh, uh, conspiracy theories, we actually find that, um, again, I'm keeping this short now, uh, we actually find that science related populism is a much stronger um, argument here uh, to use um, as conspiracy theories um, are much more often uh, linked to something that is related uh, to, to scientific conspiracies, where something um, where, to a scientific understanding, to an evidence-based understanding of how uh, spe specific, um, specific mechanisms could actually work in society. Um, this is to say that actually we need to think very careful which of these two phenomena are relevant to our research and whether and how to introduce them in our theoretical but also in our statistical models. And now I'm already coming to the final thing I want to maybe to think with you a little bit more about is we're talking a lot about how to um, understand political and science related populism. Let's focus now on science related populism and um, how, to, how to define it, how to, how to measure it. Um, we don't talk that much about um, how to counter it yet, because I mean, we've just all started on, on researching this. Um, but what I realized um, given, given these talks about science-related populism as well here in Austria is the first thing that specifically also um, um, older generations will ask me, but is it really that bad to be skeptical? Is it really that bad 
to want to 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 want to have a say in scientific processes or at least on what topics uh, scientists want to research and more often than not i then actually kind of start thinking about this i mean this is why we're doing all of this to start thinking about this and i kind of start to uh, to see that of course not all of these dimensions as i said before already are bad and that's also why we use a scale to actually figure out how to how this multidimensional concept um, um, fits fits in um, but maybe since some of these dimensions might not be as bad as others these could be the dimensions that actually could help us to understand how to counter science related uh, populism so this is to say that the supply side of populism science related or political populism actually is difficult to influence um, um, these, these the political actors are going to do what they want to do uh, irrespective of what we would like them to do but if we look for example on um, people should have more influence over over the work of scientists if, if you don't immediately think of like bad influence but they want to uh, maybe um think about how they can how they can be part of research you quite quickly come to idea to the idea of citizen science and maybe this is also the end of my presentation maybe something as such as citizen councils and citizen science could be a first step towards getting these people um, uh, back into our also especially thinking about the consequences into the democratic process um, and maybe this is the part where actually we can actually yeah we, if if these are the dimen the dimensions where we can actually say well let's let's um, find a way to to um, agree on 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 actually getting get, do um, interacting more, and this is also where maybe science communication uh, also fits in uh, better. Um, I'm open to to other ideas, and this is actually the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jakob. So. Um, as Torsten wrote in the chat, he had to leave um, for another obligation. So I will moderate the discussion. Um, yeah, so please put your hand up, put a question in the chat if you have anything you want to, to ask or to comment about. First of all, though, Mike, I actually wondered if you wanted to respond to anything uh, that Jakob has, has presented. I mean, I won't be, we, we only, we don't have that much time left. So very shortly, thanks very much, Jakob. It's very interesting. And some of the things I didn't, I didn't actually know yet. So it's really interesting to see how empirically also some of the, the facets uh, play out here. And I think the questions you pointed at are the, are the interesting questions. Like, well, what does it differ from empirically? And also, uh, well, what, and maybe what aspects also of science related populism should we actually counter? Is it always a bad thing? And how could we do so if, if necessary? And there's a couple of things like, we can't influence the supply side. I'm not sure, actually. So I think uh, there's, there's uh, uh, just very quickly, I think many of the things that we can do about science-related populism, if we want to, or about the aspects of science-related populism that we consider problematic, are things that not only actually would address science related populism, but also other forms of, of, of uh, maybe problematic critiques of, of science. Um, and there are things like the, the uh, Frank Esther and Edda Humbrecht here from our department who do work on resilient publics is their term. And they try to, to figure out what the factors are that make publics resilient towards, and they are looking at this in not science related populism or political populism, they are looking at this in misinformation. But some of the aspects that they point out, like the role of journalism and the funding of journalism, is it commercial, is it state funded, uh, uh, how free is it, uh, is there something like public service broadcasting, etc. So on the meso, but also on the micro and macro levels, there are factors I think that are interesting to discuss, and that also would tackle at least parts of the supply side, I think. Thanks. Um, Lynn, you had your hand up. Yes, thank you so much. I'm really happy that this is the topic of the week. Um, oh wait, uh, I'm a philosopher of science and biology and as well as an institutional science communicator. Thank you for both of your talks. 
So this week at the Vienna Science Studies Lab between the CEU, KOI, and University of Vienna, we, the, a new reading group started on feminist STS. And the topic this week was Clara Giordano's 2020 paper on feminist science for the people, which I think is very interesting because it seems to fit a kind of science populism model. In particular, the anti-science sentiment here is against the colonial patronizing Western masculine science that is based on and continues injustice towards, um, in this case, women, but also other minority groups, and how this issue will not be solved by democratizing, uh, democratizing or opening up a citizen science space if it is not these issues are not um, addressed. So I'm very curious whether you look into this segment um, of the demographic. Um, probably this is beyond gender demographic. It's a particular way of being a science populist, uh, this feminist approach. And in this approach, they said it especially developed post-war in the U.S. as a reaction to a another period um, when science was actually connected to nationalism and national pride during the immediate post-war period, which I found kind of foreign to current, with, given the current affairs. So it was, it was a development. So they are against science literacy um, from this perspective. So I'm curious what you think about this and whether there's work done on it. Should I just go ahead? Thanks, thanks, Lynn. Um, and that's, I haven't thought extensively about that, but that's obviously a very relevant question. I mean, one of the things that we would be, and that's like the, the highest level uh, aspect that we would be interested in is writers, uh, philosophers, political scientists of populism, and mostly that's political populism, they have, Kasmude has famously called it, well, it's a thin ideology. It's, it's not a thick ideology that is strongly related to ideas about the world, like you mentioned nationalism, for example, or a, a certain patriarchal order, maybe, and, and others. That's not necessarily inherently embedded in populism. Populism is what he calls a thin ideology, but can be connected to these things. Um, and that is actually something empirically we would be interested in, in how far, in what context, by what communicators also, is science-related populism actually connected to these host ideologies, as, as Mude uh, has called it also, um, because, and that's in our conceptual work, and when we try to figure out, well, what is out there in the, in, in, in the scholarly literature um, that connects to what we would consider science-related populism, you find that a lot, that certain fields of science and feminist science, gender studies, et cetera, are one of the prime examples that you encounter over and over again, are being tackled. By, uh, uh, by the aspect of science-related decision-making sovereignty, essentially, where the populist or science-related populist position would be, well, that's because they're ideo uh, ideological, because they're, 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 uh, 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 science is ideologically biased, and that's why they're doing these things. And we should have a say in that, because for society, other things are allegedly more important. So that's actually very interesting, or would be very interesting to look into uh, uh, in more depth. I mean, the other aspect is the citizen science aspect, or generally the role of participatory formats that, that Jakob has also uh, mentioned, um, which I think is very interesting, yet challenging to think about. Because, I mean, if you look at the people who participate in citizen science projects, or if you think, if you look at the people who you get to participate in, I think you mentioned like citizens councils, Jakob, et cetera how difficult it is to get people in these councils or how self-selected the people are who uh, for another project a couple of years back, we tried to figure out well, who are the people actually participating in citizen science. And it's very male and it's very academic and it's very um, um, uh, progressed in age, <laughs> if you like, the people who, who participate in these formats. And if you wanted to tackle something like science-related populism or other forms of, of distance or critique or, or, or uh, 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 yeah, distance to, to science, you have to get other people in there and to actually engage in a dialogue with them. And that's challenging. And that's, I think, also would be like my last point. I see Jakob already has his hand up. I think the interesting group for me for many of these aspects is not necessarily the group that is already uh, 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 
that are already full-blown supporters of science-related populism. It's probably the people who share a number of these facets, who are not quite there, but who, who are uh, uh, sympathetic to some of these ideas or some of the problematic ideas, they would be the interesting ones to talk to, to, and to engage in a dialogue with, or the most interesting ones probably, the others are also interesting. And that I think would be very worthwhile to think, think about formats of how to, how to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, Lynn, also thank you for your question. Um, I don't have an answer, let me say that right away, but I think I think what you what you said, if I understood you correctly, is exactly um, also what I've been um, um, getting like these last uh, few um, uh, weeks also when I've presented um, similar ideas. So the question is, how does science related populism and also, it's it's the same problem actually that we have with in in the in the context of political populism. How does this fit with um, uh, like the genuine the genuine problem that we see that um, from a feminist point of view, that there, there of course there there is an elite that. Uh, uh, that is that 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 works against women, or there is an elite of uh, a maybe even neoliberal male-dominated uh, academic field that might actually not want uh, feminist research to be more present. So the I think the and that this is this is similar to to what we hear with political populism, where the question is, is all critique, and this is also Mike, something you said before, is all critique of a political elite or of an academic elite or of, of an academic elite system, is that automatically populism? Is that automatically science-related populism? And then, and would we expect this kind of critique, this kind of populist critique as well? To have the same uh, consequences as a as as other kinds of of, of, of populist uh, critiques in that sense, because uh, the feminist critique of the academic system as it is, as it as it is right now, I would also say it fits very well with science related. Uh, populism ideas and uh, uh, let's say the, the the critiques that we can have uh, that we had especially after the war of uh, how politics uh, were um, uh, is also a populist idea because elites can be corrupt because elites can uh, uh, have uh, don't always have the best thing of uh, the be the best ideas in mind for the, the people. And the question is, are there maybe differences in science related populism, in types of science related populism within science related populism as an idea? I think, Lynn, this is, this is what you were aiming at. And I think this is a super interesting question. And I think this relates to the to the to how the thin ideology relates to the thick ideologies of uh, uh, right-wing ideas, left-wing ideas, feminist ideas, um, um, peace uh, movement ideas, and all of that. And I think this is something the next years of science-related populism research will have to go uh, into um, um, quite a lot. Thanks, Jakob. Um, so we just have a few minutes left. So please put your hand up or put a, a question in the chat. Um, Lynn asks for the reference. Um, and for the thin versus thick ideology, maybe someone can put that in the chat. And Julia. Hello, thank you. I hope you can hear me properly. Um, I had a remark um, for the last slide that Jakob Moritz presented when he was asking for further ideas, what one can do. So I'm a psychologist also doing research about the issue of scientific transfer. And I think what is really important is the issue of emotions and um, also the capacity to deal with ambiguous emotions maybe also and with the fact that we have to tolerate ambiguity to have like um, a good relationship also with science because science is not black and white and so is the world and um, many people out there really struggle with like the world not being black and white so i think this starts maybe even earlier than in adulthood maybe even in school already so um what i think more and more is that 
it has to have a place also in teacher education, perhaps like a proper public understanding of science. And um, if like some of us want to um, well think about where to um, best um, like um, uh, use our resources, I think it's also in teacher training, not on, not only like to um, do citizen science projects with like people in like the broader public, but to find specific um, groups where who can also be like um, multipliers of these ideas. And in my view, these are teachers actually. Thanks, Julia, and thanks for the reference, um, both. So I would just I, maybe you want to respond to Julia, but I will also sweep in with a quick question that relates, I think, a little bit to, to Lynn's question, um, because I was reflecting a bit on these popular epistemologies that are part of the definition of scientific populism. And Mike, I think you emphasize this um, focus on common sense as a key part of that and experiential knowledge. But again, I guess I was curious about both the diversity within kind of various movements um, that appear in these epistemologies. Uh, is it really it, is it really this in all the different movements and forms of scientific populism? Um, or is it really just this very thin notion of common sense and experience that you see everywhere, um, uh, even where groups have different kind of issues or concerns, if that makes sense? And you could also respond, of course, to Julia's point. Yeah, the the um, I mean, my take populism is in a way a relative concept, criticizing elites and various kinds of elites in the in the in the case of science where populism criticizes scientific elites. And then, of course, the question is: Well, how are these elites? How do they operate? And in how far is it justified, in a way, to criticize them? And that's that's if that's the basic premise that necessarily leads to well so at least aspects of science related populism don't have necessarily to be bad if you think about i don't know i grew up in the in the in eastern germany in the gdr and if you criticized science there especially in the social science field for very for certain aspects of how it was done it was probably very justified from a from a, a broader uh, scientific perspective. So I wouldn't say it's it's always a bad thing. But um, the it it depends. I'm and I'm not sure Niels would necessarily agree. We have to discuss that. But it's I think it depends on what you want to supplant it with, uh, how justified the critique is, of course, but also what you want to supplant it with. And if it's gut feeling and experiential experiences, then the question, it's the same question uh, I just posed to the elites. It's, well, how justified is that then? Um, and we have like all the way going back to, to Brian Wynn's sheep farmers in the 80s, I think, I'm not quite sure. Um, we have an, 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 a field also, we have, we know that e experiential knowledge in certain contexts is very well uh, valid and very worthwhile. But is valid and worthwhile in the end, according to scientific criteria, whereas gut feeling uh, understood in other ways may not be. And that distinction has to be made there. I think that that's an important distinction. And that applies to various fields. I mean, the, 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 the literature we looked at when we were talking about alternative epistemologies like Lisbeth van Zonen's epistemology and, and others, that comes from very different fields, some more political, some very uh, science related, some conspirational, etc. And we try to draw this, uh, draw this together here. Uh, well, I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you. Um, sorry, we have one minute remaining. Jakob, any um, final reflections? Um, yeah, maybe just building on that one, 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 a few words. Um, I think that context probably matters quite a lot, and this is um, as I'm also part political scientist. I'm always, also always like switching back and forth from literature, political uh, populism, and science-related populism. But in the core, the idea is the same. And in political populism in Austria, for example, we also saw quite a little bit of shift on whether the FPÖ is right now in government or not. And so this is something I want to say. With context, might matter. Same as in Eastern Germany at a specific time, and 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 now. Uh, when we talk about the role of science in society. Um, and um, 
So this is also something we might still have to work on both theoretically and, and in terms of measurement on whether we need to specify our measurements, measurements further in, in terms of whether we need to um, specify our theory further uh, depending on subgroups in society or, or, or subtopics uh, of science. And, and, and so there's, there's like one general rule and then there might be subtypes that we actually need to carve out a little bit further to understand like the concept as a whole a little better. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. I mean, also, if you look at political populism, what we call political populism and, and pathologize in a way or see negatively, yeah. we might see very differently in Russia. Latin Turkey. America. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yes, I'm really sorry to cut the conversation off, um, but we need to finish. I have another meeting. Uh, apart from anything else. Um, thank you so much, Mike and Jakob, uh, for really, really interesting and rich um, presentations and discussions. Um, yes, yeah, so this has been recorded. We'll put it on the YouTube channel uh, very soon. Um, the next lecture is in January, I believe the 20th of January, with uh, Monica Tadikin um, speaking about her research. I've forgotten the title, but um, all the information is on the website. Please do join us in the new year. Thank you again, everybody, and see you in 2023, if not before. Thanks. Thanks for having me.